How are you? <laughs> Doing well. Good. How has your day been? Good. So far, so good. Good. Yeah. Not bad. So um, I was pleased to hear that you guys have a lasting friendship. And you guys get Very to hear each week? Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. Monday. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's not, that's not always the case for bands. So that's great. It's true. Yeah. So can you explain the way you guys work together in the Chachwin? Well, um, like we were saying, we usually get together every Monday night. And this has gone on for a long time. Uh, I guess we started working together in, in 2002. And uh, we had a band called Angel Rust for, for many years and a side project called Forest of the Soul. It was mainly acoustic stuff. And we'd work on one or the other, but mainly it was getting together like in a band format and, and jamming uh, once or twice a week, getting ready for shows and, and whatever we were going to be recording at the time. And then that band fell through. And when I started writing this stuff that became the Chach one, just started meeting at his studio. He's had a couple studios over the years, but you've been at this one for what, 11 years? Four, 14, 14, 14 years. So, yeah, I just stop by after work and uh, bring whatever ideas I have. And uh, he has a, a really great setup here where. Um, I'm spoiled. I don't really have to demo stuff at home. I'm just like, look, I'm working on this. And then we'll set a click track, record some rough dummy tracks. And uh, it seems like when I come down the next week, he's like, hey, I put drums and bass on this. <laughs> you want to re-record the guitars? Like, good. Mm -hmm. So I'll do that. And uh, yeah, we, well, I mean, we work kind of slowly and we get sidetracked a lot. And sometimes we just drink coffee. <laughs> and don't really, <laughs> don't really do anything uh, productive. <laughs> so uh, eventually it turns into a record. And uh, yeah, that's we're, we're it's a real loose, just hanging out type of thing. It's kind of an un unorthodox. I guess, way to I guess write it music, is. I guess very, I don't want to say lackadaisical, but almost, you know. I don't know why more people don't do this, especially, you know. If you're real young and busy all the time, it's probably, you know, you got to compartmentalize your ideas. And uh, usually in a band, get together with, you know, four or five people. Uh, but since we do everything just us, it's just hanging out. It's like going to your friend's house, you know. It is going to your friend's house. But that's, awesome. that's how all of these records have turned out, it is just from getting together and you know, having some coffee and hanging out and uh, it's like chipping away at a piece of stone for a very long time <laughs> and then finally a, a sculpture comes out of this kind of thing. yeah and there's usually no grand vision of this is going to turn out like this and it's going to be about this it just it evolves and gets influenced by whatever's going on in our lives you know, it, and I'm not talking necessarily mundane, you know, work, going to the grocery store every day type of things. But like if something cool happens, if you take a trip or just something, you know, monumental happens in your personal life or uh, especially nature experiences, too. It seems like we talk about that for a long time and it bleeds into the music. Sure. I, I was going to ask about that. I, I knew you guys were into nature and that and anybody that's been out in nature very much, there's usually like a story of something um, interesting or notable that has happened. So I may as well ask you about that. Is there an experience that comes to mind as people that have enjoyed the nature? I think there's prob probably a lot of those. How many? Yeah, we're constantly recanting on yeah, times that we spend in the woods. Yeah, it, it seems like that's when like bigger ideas come about. You know, I think that didn't the concept of Nachashma pretty much come from that? Yeah, yeah, it, so. it did. I when we were playing, uh, Angel Rust was like melodic death metal, and 
really enjoy playing that and writing that stuff. But uh, the topics that were really close to my heart, I kind of kept aside, kept separate from that. And uh, uh, I want to do a project that's a little removed from that. And that's how this whole thing started. Um, when we've been out hanging out, like usually during the week, we have, you know, separate things going on. Um, but when we've taken time is like just hike in the woods or, um, get a, do a photo shoot, something like that. There's always some interaction with birds, some strange thing, strange, like, I don't know, you can say coincidental, but it feels spiritual type of thing. And, and we have a, a song on the new record that's about that. So that was definitely one we've, uh, songs about sweat lodge, uh, songs about, uh, uh, deer encounters with deer in yeah. nature and uh yeah definitely animal and bird related for sure and um a lot of things from reading historical accounts and you know just being trying to get immersed in that as much as possible yeah i actually had an amazing experience on my way home tonight um three blue herring herons and uh wow. yeah they were flying in front of me and then they landed in my yard. So it was pretty, wow. nice. yeah. Wow. Those things are huge. Yeah. yeah. I just yeah, saw dude. the wingspan and I thought, what is that? But yeah. So that was pretty neat. They find some connection to something else going on in your life with threes or something or, yeah. 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 It's all interconnected. Pretty neat. Yeah. I've had a lot of bird experiences as well. Um, so I was wondering too, when you, so when you're composing music, do you find ideas are coming to you all the time then, or do you find there's a specific concentrated time that well, comes to you? I think that's part of the reason why we take the time that we do is because there are plenty of, there's times where he will come in, Aaron will come in and he's very inspired. Um, and he's got a good chunk of music already in his head um and you know we build on that and sometimes the song comes together fairly quickly um but then there's times too where yet yeah, we still get together weekly and it's we say well what do we have to work on well i don't really have anything and i mean and that's okay yeah. um yeah. it's what we recognize that you can't force inspiration and um it comes when it comes and you just kind of have to wait for it to come and um uh we recognize it when it's there and we ride that way when it's there as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. I, I think every musician wishes that they could conjure it up, uh, on command and will it into existence when they need it, because a lot of times you really need it. You really need to write a song or you really need to come up with some material. And if it's not there, it's just not there. So, um, we, yeah, we just kind of take it as it comes and, you know, because, we write the way that we do and it's such a collaborative thing and it's such a, I don't want to say an instantaneous thing, but it's, there's very few preconceived notions in this music that it's all kind of like born very spontaneously. Um, I think that's why it, it takes so long. And, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's no regrets in the music and there's no, Oh, we rushed this or, um, we put this on here when, you know, just because we were forced to, we never work with any deadlines. And I think that's a liberty that a lot of bands aren't afforded. A lot of projects aren't affor afforded. And uh, to us, I think it pays off. Yeah. Binder has been very gracious about that. And just, just do what you guys do. It doesn't matter how long it takes and definitely try for quality or the quantity. But, uh, I, I feel like, I, I'm slowing down a little bit as far as those because the last couple of years I've been really distracted uh, with work and just other other irons in the fire, you know. It's life, and, it's life and I, I need to get back to that place. And I will. But one thing that's kind of a hang up for me as far as that is that I have a hard time moving on to the next thing until the thing that I just did is out there. Yeah. And we're finalizing the new record right now. It's it's actually ready to go. I was going to ask you about the streets. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? 
I was going to ask you about that. So that's great to hear um, about the new material. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, where we're at is everything's, I think, right? Everything's good to go. Yes. Just send it off to the plant. I'm hearing about really long waits for vinyl right now, like yeah. nine month waits and stuff. And I hope that's not the case. We'll have some teaser things out or a single, a song, video, something like that before long. But um, yeah, I have a hard time. Like, okay, time for the new thing until this thing's like completed. And uh, I, need to, I need to get over that. Maybe once it's sent off, I'll check that box. And I think that's a natural thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so which way did you end up going for this one? Because I know I had heard there was like an interview where you're talking about how you had some acoustic material you were working on as well as some more heavy material. And you were working on both and you sort of had two things going. So which way did it, did it end up taking? Which direction did you end up sort of finalizing? Done your research. Yeah, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty impressive. So I don't remember that. I don't remember when I talked about that. <laughs> sure. You were actually talking to a guy from the label. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. It was must have been that live, live stream. Uh, stream. Yeah. 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 You're yeah. right. You're right. So, um, well, for this record, it's we went the heavy route. Yeah. Yeah. And it's um, definitely. The heaviest, like I right. most consistently, like we like gradually injected more metal into each album yeah. as we've gone. Uh, with the exception of Ancient Pulse, was like a lot of you know, it was like a compilation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say this has more even than Heart of Akamon, and uh, it doesn't mean it's all you know the blasting all the way through, but it's definitely more more metal and uh, there's more. I'd say some traditional metal elements, not just black metal, um, some doom metal. Uh, the the other material, there's some old school death metal in there. There's some old school death metal for sure. Um, and uh, the acoustic material has been, some of it's been sitting, waiting for a home. And it's like, it's good stuff. It's not reject material. It's just something that just did not thematically fit with yeah. the other records that we've done. And it's like, it's, this stuff's not getting any younger. So we have a loose compilation of all that stuff. We just need to put the, the finishing touches on that. And uh, so that will probably be the next thing in line for that. And that's another thing that I want to get. Okay, this is out there. Time to focus on something, something totally new. Yeah. Yeah, we will. We will. Oh. Well, what I told Marty when we, I was doing the live stream the other week was that I think <clears throat> the new record is everything that we've always done just taken up several notches. It's not just one notch. The The black metal is, is the most scathing extreme black metal that we've ever done. The, the, the death metal moments, which were, there, were very few mm -hmm. up until now, um, are there and the the organic moments and the more progressive moments I think of the album are the most progressive that we've ever explored yet. Um, which, you know, I guess it's natural to say, you know, it's a natural progression. It's like, well, it's the most this that we've ever done. But um, yeah, I just think it's amped up like several notches. It's almost it's almost like we skipped over a, an album and and yeah, it's the, the album good. after that. That's you know? a good way to put it. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. it See, there's good. a lot of nods to what's that? I'm looking forward to it sounding like something special. So <laughs> oh great, great. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's a lot of a lot of influences on this one that are kind of nods to bands that we grew up with and, and respect from from way back. There's little elements you'll hear of. You know, those guys listen to Eucharist. They listen to Metallica. They listen to Rod and Christ, whoever it is. There's like little nods here and there. So we hope you enjoy it. Great. So what would you say is your favorite part then? Is it the creation of music or is it sort of pre presenting it, the presentation after you've created yeah, that's, it? That's a tough one. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Ah. Uh, <laughs> 
for me, I'd have to say the the former. Um, I really like getting these progress reports of like we okay, we're three songs into the album and they're not mixed yet. And driving around listening to them and formulating like this is this needs something over top of it or you know this this would sound really great over this part whatever i love that it keeps me like artistically fulfilled yeah. and then once that is completed it's like here you go i've listened to this a million times right <laughs> have fun and then i like where where do i go now like what what yeah. do i what direction do i take so uh i love seeing it completed because it would be a huge bummer if it never you work that much and sure you, you it's, a means, it. it's a means to an end but i'm with yeah. you and i totally am i'm in love with both parts of the process for sure but if i had <clears throat> if i had to choose one lover in that scenario i would choose the creation process over the presentation process i would say yeah. basically for the same reason that you did just the, the whole sculpting the whole building of <laughs> That makes sense. Of the music uh, is what I get the most fulfillment out of. Yeah, and when, when you stumble upon some like personal elements that you put into the lyrics or you know just into the feeling of the music, you're you're working through something. You're either like reliving an experience you had, or you're working through a problem, you know, thoughts about things, whatever. And that's like a really powerful spiritual thing. Yeah, and then. Later on, when you listen to songs, you don't have quite as raw an experience with them. It's like you listen to it as a song, but uh, the, the, I don't know, the newness of it is worn off, I guess. You right. know what I mean? It's not as impactful as when you first came up with this part. It's like, oh, wow, that sounds really good. I sure. like how that turned out. You know, it's like anything else. The more you see it, the more you hear it, the more you get used to it. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's less exciting every time, right? But when the first time and the first few times when you're building it, it's like yeah. super impactful to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. So I know you're both musicians of several instruments and vocals. So um, is anybody in your family musical or someone else? Did they leave their musical imprint on you? Or how do you feel like you came to, to music? Got, no, there's no musicians in my family whatsoever. None. Okay. I had heard that both of my grandmothers played the guitar in some form. I don't know what skill level they were. I never heard them play. Uh, I have my grandmother's guitar from 1937. I don't know if she ever played it. I think my other grandmother played the steel guitar. Never heard her play. Nobody else does anything except my son. He plays uh, drums and piano. But no one before directly influenced me i heard my granddad play the harmonica when i was real little then well, he that played counts. in the navy yeah that counts, that counts. i guess it got me interested in yeah. wow you could play an instrument you yeah. know i was real little but other than that no it's just been uh just hearing Aiden and metallica and it was my stuff when i was younger it was my youngest sister's boyfriend who introduced me to music initially because he was the first real musician I ever met. He was a keyboard player and a bass player. And this was mid eighties and he would bring over his keyboard and he'd put the headphones on my head and he would play like the intro to jump from Van Halen. And I was like <laughs> blown away that I'm using, you know, that I'm sitting in a room with somebody that's playing music. I was like my, the first real exposure that I had to you know, live music and, and knowing someone who could play an instrument. So it was like mind blowing to me, but just like you, and I guess I should probably give my grandmother credit because I remember finding my grandmother's old guitar in a closet. It had one string on it. And that was technically the first stringed instrument that I ever picked up and plucked. But I never, ever remember anybody in my family ever mentioning my grandmother playing guitar. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it's something she just bought on a whim and never, ever played, but technically I owe her that at least. Yeah. 
it's good to have something to mess around on, even mm-hmm. if it has one string. Yeah, they yeah. play a part. You touch the story. They play the part in the so. so you both live music outside of the band. So, um, Aaron, you teach music, and Andrew, you have a recording studio. So uh, you've been involved in bands together and separate from each other as well. So what is it like to live and, and breathe music pretty much all the time? Like, I think you live and breathe music a little bit more than I do. Yeah, I, I teach in separate places. I, I teach at a, a private college in, in music studios. And uh, since the pandemic, I've been doing the, the Zoom teaching okay. as well. Yeah. That's become a thing. Um, and I play classical and uh, fingerstyle guitar gigs all the time. Uh, it's for dinners and, and weddings and such. Uh, so, yeah, I'm doing this, I'm doing this full time. It feels great. I remember, you know, doing tons of jobs that I didn't really want to be doing. I liked getting a paycheck, but like, I don't want to do this forever. Mm-hmm. And um, it doesn't really get boring. People are always bringing different music to you. And um, sometimes you become a little bit of a sounding board. I wouldn't say a therapist, but something along those lines, like people after a while feel like they can open up to you and you can take a half hour out of your day and talk about music and whatever else. And I like being that, that role part of that role in their lives. And uh, so, yeah, it, it feels great. And I really don't want to do anything else. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, my, and even though I have a studio, my studio is just, I used to record uh, local bands for years and years and years. Um, and just the older that I got, the more I wanted the free time and not to have to stare at a screen, waste my summers. Well, it's not a waste, I guess, but spending my summers staring at a computer screen, recording somebody else's music um, instead of enjoying the summer. Um, so I don't really do that anymore. And I uh, I record pretty actively still, but only if it's something that, like what we do if it's something i'm intimately involved in yeah. um but the studio has never been my my bread and butter it's never been my bill paying mechanism i've never paid a bill with anything that i've ever made off the studio um i do what i love and i, I love what i do and i'm not going to discredit that i i've worked at a tattoo shop for almost 20 years um and i, I do love that but that's my day job as it were um and, you know, I guess I kind of balance it out where you where you live and breathe music a little bit more as far as your career is concerned. You know, I'm more in active bands that are gigging all the time. And you're also full time around art. It's just not oral. It's right. Visual art. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so you're you know, full time in the arts. Yeah. So my environment is sure. constantly inspiring one way or the other. Um, but you know, as far as living and breathing music, you know, it's not necessarily my career as much as it is. Is there anywhere that I can see your, your artwork that you've done or? Like the um, yeah, if you go to uh, Hot Rod Tattooing, it's the name of our, my tattoo shop. It's mm-hmm. in Martinsbury, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Hot Rod Tattooing. Yep. We have a ton of insanely talented artists. So your music can be described as beautiful, even though it's got a harshness to it and aggression so do you remember when aggressive music sort of became beautiful to you or that like how you found the beauty in it when you found that yeah that's a good question it's, you can go first. It's, I, I, it's a great question i mean there's like pockets of it everywhere um some people might think it's kind of blasphemous to say but like uh when i got into blessed are the sick I'm more of an angel there's some like beautiful music on that album. Absolutely. I know it's like super, you know, uh, brutal death metal album, but there's some awesome guitar on there. There's some awesome, uh, the uh, organ stuff on there. I think that was probably the first thing for me that set them apart from like Napalm Death or, um, you know, some of the grindier bands or some of the like really, really, sick ugly death metal bands was that album um and then when i heard the 
the first Anathema album, Serenades and uh, Solar Lovers by Celestial Season, uh, My Dime Bride. Doom stuff really hit me hard in the mid 90s, early 90s, mid 90s. So it's just like, it's amazing the emotions they can get across in this music. And it's just lumped in with the, the sickest autopsy type bands, you know, but at the same time, it's, has a poetic and beautiful element to it that uh, really opened my mind to what's possible with extreme metal. I have, uh, well, I don't think I had the typical musical evolution that a lot of other people and like our age demographic did because a lot of the kids that I went to school with and stuff, they started out with like lighter rock bands like Guns N' Roses and you know, more mainstream stuff. And I, I like, I, the first metal band that I heard was Iron Maiden. And as soon as I heard Iron Maiden, I fell in love. And then from no, it wasn't long after that. And it was circumstantially, I heard thrash like Metallica and all these other thrash bands. And from that point, I just became kind of obsessed with whatever was the most extreme. Um, and I went through like the grindcore phase and the death metal phase and the second wave of black metal. But eh, especially now in my older age, I realize like if it basically, if it doesn't have any melody to it, then I'm, I really don't listen to it anymore. Um, so, but there are tons of bands that you could consider extreme, like, you know, all the Swedish melodic death metal bands, you know, yeah. um, they were super extreme and they were super melodic at the same time. So I've always gravitated towards melody in music and, to me, that's where the real beauty lies. Melody and harmony. You mentioned Iron Maiden. That was what, yeah. what got me. Jeez, uh, with uh, Sea of Madness and uh, think it, Where Eagles Dare. Anything that had those twin guitar and even the three guitar harmonies. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That was earlier than any of the death metal stuff that I heard. Yeah, and definitely beautiful. And you hear it, you know, threads of it, like you said. Swedish scene and stuff, Storm of the Lights, Bane, and the stuff, the twin guitar harmonies and stuff. And it's very dark, very cold, evil stuff, but it's very beautiful sure. music all through it, too. Yeah, huge influences like that. So, can you both explain the names you've taken on in the bands uh, and what they mean? So, there's Nachachman and uh, Renison. So, what, what do they mean? <laughs> Nachachman means walks alone. And uh, when, I, when I was given that name, I think I was 14, and it's it was given kind of, I was always doing my own thing. I was like the long-haired kid, listen to metal, wore these, you know, carcass shirts and stuff. And it's like, you're doing your own thing, and you're not like anybody else in the, in the school or, or anything. And uh, so, yeah, I've had that name even since the first first band that I played in was called Dethrone and uh, used that. We all had stage names or whatever. He used that. And so that name stuck. And when I started uh, getting more active with the, the group of uh, Shawnee and Lenape uh, descendants in Pennsylvania, that was my name because we all had native names. And um, so that's stuck ever since. And so, when I decided to do a project just based on this stuff, that was the the natural thing for me to go with, which was to just use that as the yeah. project name. And then my pseudonym might be a little too deep for you to understand. Honestly, roughly translates to he drums. Okay. He's a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. very simple. He yeah. drums. His ancestry is Irish and Italian. Italian yeah. Irish and Italian. Yeah. So I was like, you're the drummer, man. Yeah. Yep. But it worked. I never questioned it. <laughs> he gave it to me and I accepted it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, Aaron, you became very interested in history and indigenous um, culture as a child. When did you realize you had indigenous an ancestry and who helped you along your journey discovering more about it? Yeah, we never we never talked about that. And I've had I had long talks with my grandfather uh, on my mom's side, who's 
passed, and I know he's been passed for several years, but um, I think he, well, I had to approach him about it. Um, it was my mother who talked to me about it here and there when I was a kid, and I didn't really pay attention, any attention to it until I was maybe about 12 or 13, and then I got turned on to some historical narratives and stuff. I started asking more questions. I said, why don't you ever talk about this? And she's like, your granddad would know more. So I started talking to him and he's like, yeah, when I was growing up, it was, he's like, that's the worst thing that you could be. And they, you know, pretended there was no, uh, no connection or anything. And I mean, there's not to talk ill of my, my area, but there's been some systemic racism of, many kinds here and uh i mean i'm sure it still exists in, in some pockets too but yeah it was i don't think he was like reprimanded or anything but yeah anytime he would talk about it it's like no we don't talk about that but he was enamored with it in, himself and would have lots of um kind of stereotypical indian pictures around and i was like Tell me more about this. It's like, oh, you should have talked to some people when when he was younger and stuff. But um, yeah, the I had to go into research mode to find out more about this because um, Indians were removed in uh, 1830, 1832 from what's now West Virginia. It was West, it was Virginia at the time. And uh, Shawnees were removed to Missouri and then eventually uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas, uh, depending on the band. And uh, as far as I know, everybody that stayed around here uh, spoke English, uh, took jobs like farmers and blacksmiths and just assimilated. And that's on that, on my mom's side, what I'm descended from. So. My mission's always been to find out more about those people by connecting with other people that are in the same situation. And I think a lot of people in West Virginia and Appalachia in general are uh, in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania as well. So that's where I got the interest. And then it kind of branched from like, well, you know, I'm not the only important element or the important, most important person here. Like, what can I find out about all of this? Like, how did this culture go from, you know, nature-based harmony to modern European-style civilization? And you know, it comes out in the songs here. So, um, yeah, a lot of um, missing pieces, miss, missing pieces of puzzles, and a lot of reading and research. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you're doing that. Um... Did your, Sorry, was a really long way. <laughs> oh, did your grandfather get to hear any of the church or no no okay. by the time this had come about he started to get dementia and he okay. got really uh he got really weird for lack of better terms and uh yeah he he changed and um yeah it was it was dementia it's really sad what it does to people and yeah. uh yeah we did not he did not part on the best of terms with anyone in the family, sadly. Um, but yeah, we had many good conversations before that about the subject. But no, he's, I, I mean, I'm, I may have mentioned something. He he heard me play quite a few times. He always say, you got to keep doing that. You sound really good. Keep doing that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. that was about as far as it got. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you literally had me looking on a map at the geography of the Appalachian area, as well as reading about history. Um, so obviously it's, per, it's a personal journey for you, but is that what you're hoping your music will do for listeners is encourage them to look deeper into the areas they live and the history and, or like you said, honestly, you're, you're researching in the are, for yourself yeah. too. So obviously. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the original intent yeah. was, to connect with other people, but it, it totally has. Um, we have people right from many, many different places. And uh, usually it'll be, uh, I didn't know anything about this region that you live in or anything that happened there or, you know, any of these events. And 
you got me really interested in it. Here's something similar that happened in my area or whatever. Yeah. And I learned from that and uh, they, they make a connection. And, you know, I think we all reach the same conclusions eventually. And uh, if you're looking that up, Appalachia is big. It's, yeah. a, it's a big region. And I, yeah, I, I didn't really realize until maybe two years ago when I saw a defined map of it, I was like, wow, I thought it was just, you know, a little yeah. strip. And, and then I always thought we were in the foothills of Appalachia. Like, oh, we're not really Appalachia. We live 40 miles from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Right. This is like almost a suburb. <clears throat> not quite, but almost. But no, you look at that map. It's a big oval of a big area. Mm-hmm. And I would say that um, presenting history in this format, like as music, is a lot more um, easy to take in, I would say, like for myself, for instance, taking that in compared to, you know, re- sitting down and having to read a book or even watch something or whatever. So, yeah, it's a, a nice way to present it, I think. I appreciate that. I, I, hope, I hope we're doing a good job at it. <laughs> I would hope so. So can you share a, an heirloom that you received and the meaning behind it or something that was passed down to you, both of you? I just, I just mentioned it because I, I saw a video where you were talking about how you had heirlooms that were passed down, but you didn't say any, what any of them were. So I was just wondering if there's anything that sticks out that was passed down to you. That might be interesting. I, I have several. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, when I was 14 or 15, um, yeah, like I was saying, I was playing in a death metal band called The Throne. And our drummer said, hey, there's this guy that I know of. Um, you should write him. He plays in uh, a death metal band called Roger Board. And uh, he's an Indian. Who could talk. You should write him. And back then, you wrote letters and yeah. traded tapes and such. So I started writing to him in 1992. And uh, he had uh, a, a travel group for a while that's really uh, fell away over the years, unfortunately. And uh, we'll see each other as often now. Uh, but he early on did not know me in, in person. He sent me an ash bag that was, at the time I'm like, you gotta, you gotta be direct. Like, I don't understand real cryptic stuff. And I got used to that after a while, these cryptic kind of, Yoda type conversations, you know, and but what is this? He's like, well, you know, we'll talk sometime and I'll tell you the meaning behind that. And, you know, years past, these ashes were for fires that were continuously, uh, I mean, on a molecular level or whatever, had ashes that went back thousands of years. It had just oh, been wow. yeah. rejuvenated. And having that in my possession, I, I feel like it's been. I don't know, kind of a guardian in a way. And uh, years later, he brought me a, a proper Shawnee ash bag that I've never seen. It was the old style, it was painted, and he gave that to me with, with some of the ashes. And I, I think keeping these ashes is uh, like a, almost like a living link to the past, yeah. very, very distant past. So um, those are some of the most special items that I have in my bundle. For sure. I mean, you got me thinking. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really have too many significant things that were passed down to me like that. Um, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head, and it, it's here and it has some relevance, is I had a cousin, but I referred to her as my aunt because she was really good friends with my mother. Um so I, everybody in the family called her Aunt Rosie. Um, <clears throat> and she was the aunt that would spoil you to death. And, you know, you always wanted to spend the weekend at her house because she gave you whatever you wanted. Um, <laughs> she just treated you like gold. Um, and she was super supportive of everything that I've ever done. She never, ever, I don't know. She was just like the kindest, gentlest soul in the world. Um, and I'll never, ever forget her, but she gave me, I think, I think it was at her house. In fact, I know it was at her house. 
And I just became enamored with it. And I asked her for it. And of course, you know, I was her golden boy, so she gave it to me. But it used to sit up there on the monitor, that turtle. Ah, okay. It's a little carved turtle. And it's really dark, um, really well carved out. But it had two big fake emeralds for eyes. And one of them (laughs) fell out a long, long time ago. Um, so it's a one eyed emerald eyed turtle. And I, I love that thing. And it's still here. I mean, you know, I'm 45. She probably gave that to me when I was like six years old or something. Yeah. So it's still here just because it reminds me of her. And yeah. I mean, it's a turtle. So it kind of has some relevance to me, Josh, when I get, <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. That's all I got. So I often go to music for different moods. For example, when I'm excited or upset. Can you give me an example of a song that you would go to for a specific mood? I, in our, like in our catalog or no, no, outside, any band? outside of your catalog? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. That shouldn't be hard to answer. And it kind of is. It's more recent, but whenever I'm like, if I need to get pumped, if I need to get excited, if I need to get psyched up about something, um, I'm a huge fan of the band High Spirits from Chicago. Um, and the first song off the, Motiv- the Motivator album, as it were, um, <laughs> Flying High. Whenever I listen to that, I'm like, I'm ready to go, man. I'm ready to conquer whatever. Yeah. If I need to get pumped, it's um, uh, for victory. Bolt thrower, see? Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, working out or something. Yeah, on a bike. Yeah, war metal. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, I love Doom Your Bands, Funeral Doom. I, I don't go to it as often lately, I would say. Um, but I think if I'm feeling nostalgic or something, I'll, I'll go back to some old Floyd records. Yeah. Uh, good bit. Um, I don't know. I guess there's there's a lot of metal albums. Uh, I don't know if I if I'm like on a road trip or something. I'll uh, Merciful Fate, um, their first two albums. Uh, Anathema. That's some pretty deep emotional music, though. If you're mm-hmm. feeling, but feeling down, I listen to kind of down music. Yep. I tend not to get so I, much uplifting. I, like, like, I, people yeah, people. and I tend to get ninety nine point nine percent of my emotions from Iron Maiden. I think they pretty much provide me with everything that I need. Whether yeah. it's up or down, or angry or sad or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Iron I, Maiden has it all for me. For At sure. least those first eight albums. You know, I could find whatever I need in those eight albums. Yeah, yeah I listen to that Sirius XM a good bit. So I have that now, and it, I never turn. Maiden or Sabbath or Dio or I don't know uh, the classics. Uh, I guess we all kind of stick with the same stuff. They're classics for a reason. They are. They are, and they they never get old, and they get better with age. It's true. They do. Totally agree. So this is my last question. What are three things on your bucket list? Mine are all, mine are all locations. Mine are all, they're not really achieving anything. They're just going places, I guess. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. um, I definitely want to go to Japan. Um, I definitely want to go to Italy and I definitely want to go to, is it, um, it's falling out of my head now. Um, you gotta take it off your bucket list. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you gotta find different countries. I think it's it, it, Anchor Watts. Is Anchor Watts in Cambodia? Ah, is it Cambodia? Cambodia? Okay, yeah. yeah. So I definitely want to go to Cambodia too. Yeah. I'm just enamored with ancient, ancient historical sites. Mm-hmm. So I have a short list of those. No, Egypt. I'm Kenley. I mean, yeah, I would love to, but if I had to really narrow it down to three, uh, yeah, I would say those two. Uh, All right, for sure. For different reasons. Yeah. I feel like I just had this thought like not too long ago about bucket list stuff. Um, 
definitely places for me as well. Um, I'd like to see more European countries and, and quite a few already, but uh, never to Scandinavia and uh, not too much into um, like uh, Croatia, uh, Albania, that area. I'd like to check it out. And Greece, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of places, but I guess that's one on, on the bucket list. Um, I don't know. Got me stumped a little bit God, here. God. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I'm sure, I'm sure later on I'll think of a hundred. Yeah. Uh, that's usually how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not giving I know. I wouldn't even know my answers, honestly, to that question. But <laughs> it's. A, I mean, it's tough. It's a pretty big question. I've always wanted to put a book out. I've always wanted to write a book. Yeah. Yeah. Always wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. I just learned something new. Well, when I was telling you recently, I've been working on transcriptions of my own stuff, and then that I knew, but I didn't know it was like a, a goal. That was the goal, and it, it kind of sucks because most people now want. A download of oh, I just want this one song, right? And you know, pay pay the guy five bucks and lame. You download it, and that I want an actual book with notes and right. stuff, and like all these the Joshman records, I read a synopsis and what the songs are about and stuff. And I think it's because like subconsciously, I want to be an author, and I, I'm not disciplined enough to be one. I think that's so, cool though. I wish every band yeah. did that with every album because every band that you know. Any album that I'm truly interested in, and I, I think pretty much anyone could agree, you want to know as much about the story yeah. behind the album as possible, right? Or at least have it available. Yeah, and so Somewhere. many albums are just so, like, no, they're just filled with, like, a big thanks list. I don't care who you're thanking. Tell me what Tell me what the meaning of this behind this song is. Yeah. Know? So I think it's really cool. That. Yeah, anecdotal stuff. Um and I don't, I don't mean necessarily a book that expands on uh, what what we're making music about. I guess that's kind of where this came from in the first place with, with the Josh one is that I was reading all these historical books and stuff. And it's kind of a hobby going to these places on the weekend and say, you know, this battle happened here or this person's buried here or whatever. And uh, reading this stuff during the week and getting into it, like, you know, I'd like to be in this seat. You know, there's the metal scene. I have a metal band, blah, 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 whatever. This author scene is a very, you know, very obscure field to be in for the for the subject matter. But I never thought that I could hold a candle to any of these authors. They're just, their research is mind-blowing that they do into this stuff. And I'm just not knowledgeable or disciplined enough. But I think I, I write well yeah I, i've you know written things for you know degree programs and things but um i've never centered on the exact thing that that i want to do in my own book um, so that's why i started working on guitar transcriptions because that's something that somebody might want um yeah as far as the third bucket list thing uh, i don't know i don't really want to like jump out of a plane or anything that's usually what people say. Right, right. You know, I might do it. Yeah. I might do it or something um, somewhere down the road. But um, I think I'd like to take a year off and not work before yeah. I die. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I think I'm in a field where you have to keep working until you die. And that's okay because it's, you know, playing music and yeah. teaching music. I don't ever want to stop doing that or retire, but I would like to, to have like, a sabbatical of sorts and just travel around and not have to worry about a deadline of, Oh, I got to be back by next week. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah, that's amazing. That's yeah. my 2021 bucket list. That might change. <laughs> cool list. <Sure. laughs> Thank you very much for um, taking the time to talk to me. Thanks for having yeah, us. Thank you for having us. For reaching out. Yeah. All the best to you guys. Thanks. Yes. Same to you. Keep in touch. We can yeah. do an interview anytime. Okay. Have a great day. All right. Day. Take you care. You too. Take care.